Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox and Mike DiBernardis back for another episode. And today we're going to take up one of the juiciest worldwide anti-corruption enforcement actions we have had, and that involves Goldman Sachs. So first of all, welcome back, Mike. Thanks, Tom. Uh, uh, happy to be back and looking forward to this discussion. So this case had everything. Uh, probably dancing girls were somewhere involved as well. Uh, I'm just going to read the scope, Mike, of the agencies involved in receiving fines and penalties from Goldman Sachs. It included the Department of Justice, U.S. Department of Justice, U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, the U.S. Federal Reserve System, the U.K. Financial Conduct Authority, the U.K. Bank of England, England Prudential Regulation Authority, the Hong Kong Securities and Futures Commission, the Singapore Monetary Authority, the Singapore Commercial Affairs Department, and the New York State Department of Financial Services. It was really never clear to me what the total fine and penalty was. It was somewhere between 2.9 and 3.3, but I could never figure it out. It was uh, a lot. Right? It was a lot, and it was the biggest. It involved the scandal uh, with the Malaysian government over uh, the country's sovereign wealth fund, 1MDB. And Goldman Sachs got into trouble uh, because it was the issuer for three bond offerings, uh, Project Magnolia, Project Maximus, and po Project Catalyst, which were floated uh, over about 18 months uh, in 2012 and 2013. It was, uh, each bond offering was about at $2 billion, and there was corruption involved in floating the bonds. There was corruption after the bonds were floated and the monies were funded because a large portion of the monies generated by these bond offerings was stolen by the then prime minister and his wife of Malaysia and one of the great characters and all of anti-corruption, Jay Lowe. So uh, we have not had any resolution with Mr. Lowe. He's allegedly in China, but we've had the former prime minister, Najib Rabib of uh, Malaysia has been convicted his wife has been convicted. We had one guilty plea from a Goldman Sachs partner, uh, Timothy Leisner, and one conviction of a Goldman Sachs employee. Uh, those are sort of the basic facts. Um, the compliance department of Goldman Sachs did not shine in this, uh, but maybe it would be appropriate for you to, to let's give us your thoughts on some of the failures that uh, you saw at uh, Goldman Sachs. Uh, yeah, you know, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna flip that on its head. I'm gonna start with some of the successes, believe it or not, that I think actually, uh, whether intentionally or not, come through in the charging documents because there definitely were failures, and, and I'll I'll talk about those. But the compliance apparatus was not a failure overall, and I think it, it started in 2009 or so when when Timothy Leisner and and Roger Ng. Uh, started working with Mr. Lowe, wanted to do business with him. And so they were trying to bring him into the bank as a client. Uh, and they kept proposing him in various forms and to various different locations within Goldman Sachs as a, you know, a private banking client. Get this guy onboarded, please. He's going to give us huge, huge business. And then the compliance function, which was really two pieces at Goldman Sachs at the time, which was the compliance department and a business intelligence group, continually rejected him. As a, as a client, despite really pretty intense pressure to accept him. And as I said, efforts to get him in as, as a client in Europe, but no, okay, how about a client in Singapore? How about we take his businesses on as clients? And so this is all laid out in the, in the charging documents. I think that shows that there, was, there were some things that were working within, within the bank. Um, but obviously something failed here. So what I really think we have here is a not a system-wide failure, but a failure in a very specific instance and, and a failure in, in two main ways. You know, the, the way that Goldman was set up at the time, they had a, um, a, a firm-wide capital committee. So this, this business committee that, that reviewed all of their potential involvement in debt, debt offerings. And, and the business intelligence group and compliance were both part of that. Where they failed here is it, it was everyone was suspicious from the start as as Mr. Leisner and, and, and Mr. Ng brought these potential deals to the table that Joe Lowe was involved. And, and they, we already had knowledge within Goldman that 
that we have no idea where this guy got his money. He's got red flags all over the place. And all they did to check was ask the question, right? All they did was, was ask the deal team, hey, is, is, you know, is Lowe involved in this? And when they got the answer, no, they moved on. What I thought was interesting is in other bond offerings, they had done electronic surveillance, electronic review to confirm questions that they had. So they looked at emails from the deal team to confirm. They decided not to do that here. And had they done it, this is really laid out really well in the charging documents, it would have been really obvious on its face that, that the deal team was lying and that Lowe was orchestrating the whole thing. So that was, I think that was the first failure was, was a lack of follow-up, maybe a lack of rigor in, in how they were assessing this, this red flag. And then the second major one that I spotted here was a, a lack of identification of contextual red flags, right? So you already, you, you laid it out. They did these three bond offerings in an 18 month period, which is a lot. We're talking $6 billion that they raised in 18 months. That sort of, you know, when you get to the second offering or the third offering, should have raised some red flags about what, what's happening here. Apparently, if you looked at the, the deal memos themselves, it didn't fully describe how all the money was going to be used because the reality was all the money was not going to be used. It was going to be siphoned off in, in large amounts to, to go to government officials and to these individuals involved. And even the official accounting of the monies from, from Project Magnolia moving forward, it, it, it had all not been used and they were already gearing up to use to, to raise more. And that should have set off some, some red flags internally within Goldman to say, Hey, let's look at this a little more carefully. So that that sort of you know each this is a specific context. Each I think business transaction has its own context, and it's important I think to to have those red flags in mind. And, and here they they sort of failed to to address those ones that were pretty obvious. So uh, I really like the way you laid that out, and you're absolutely correct to note that the Goldman Sachs compliance function did have some successes, and they were able to keep the company from onboarding JLo as a client or knows what their fine and penalty would have been if they had done that. The other thing is, and, and you started to touch on those or you did touch on those. One of the things we've tried to do in this podcast series is, is talk about some of the lessons learned and the bigger the cases got, sometimes we struggled to bring a distinct or discreet lesson to a compliance professional that they could if not implement, think about. And in this case, it's actually, in the way you laid it out, I thought it brought some great lessons for the compliance professional. And let me just start with a couple of them. The risk or the lesson of time, the timing of these bond offerings. You're absolutely right. $6 billion in 18 months. Someone should have asked the question, why? And whether that's in compliance, whether it's in the deal team, uh, that is it's not something I think compliance professionals are trained to ask. But it, in, you're absolutely right. Contextually, in this matter, it made a difference. And, and as you also noted, they hadn't even used up Maximus before they moved uh, to the next one. So the risk of time is not something we think about, but I would ask compliance professionals to think about that if they see a series of deals that individually might not be suspicious, but kind of put them all together, at least ask some questions, uh, number one. The uh, second point was risk is never static. It's always dynamic. And the where as Goldman Sachs, their bread and butter is bond offerings. That's what they've done for 100 years. And they can probably do bond offerings with their eyes closed, even if they shouldn't. But the difference was it was Goldman Sachs money that was buying up many of these bonds. So it was their money at risk. And if the bond didn't float, it was their money that would be hung out uh, that they would have to pay redemptions on. And so that added a risk factor that was noted in the charging documents. I'm not sure how much it may have driven uh, these deals going forward, but it's certainly a different level of risk when it's your, your money. And that is uh, something that uh, you should also take uh, into account. Probably for me, Mike, the most specific thing that I can bring home from this case to the compliance practitioner is 
trust but verify. Mm -hmm. uh, they did ask the deal team, was Lowe involved? And the deal team lied to their face. Uh, there was one instance where I think uh, Leisner was specifically asked that question, and he said, no, he's not involved. And the surveillance that was available internally at Goldman was used in other, other deals. And if that had been used here, I think it would have turned up uh, exactly some of the things we were talking about. But you simply cannot take the word of somebody, you know, have a document verify it or, or have an internal control verify it or have a something verify it. And um, that that is something that every compliance professional can take away from this. Perhaps the most prescient single comment I heard on this case, Mike, was there was a, a guy from tele, a compliance professional from Tel Aviv who wrote a blog post in the FCPA blog. And he said, like in poker, if you can't spot the fool at the table, <laughs> you may be that fool. And anybody who's ever been to Las Vegas certainly knows that maxim. And I've used the term the fool a lot in my blogging, but I've always thought about it as the noun from Shakespeare's King Lear as a character and as a character who is in many ways the conscience of the king. But here, I think Asher Miller is really on to something and that the compliance function, when it came to the deals, wasn't being given the truth. And they were being lied to. And, and whether they were the fool for that or whether they there was some other reason, it was the failure of compliance uh, to ask those questions. And the other thing you, you touched on when you started that, interestingly enough, was in the Monaco memo last week was structure. And in 2007, when I was uh, in the corporate world and we were dealing with a DPA, the monitor was extremely concerned with structure because he wanted compliance visibility literally all the way down a chain. He didn't want an operations reporting to somebody who reported to somebody who ended up at reporting to the CFO without compliance visibility. And the same for the legal department. If you were in South America, he wanted you reporting directly up to home office in London. And here we had the structure of the compliance department prevented or denied the knowledge from the private client group about JLo and their investigation and noting red flags and going so far as to say, we can't do business with this guy. That information didn't get over to the three groups who oversaw the deals. And so we had uh, really a structural failure. And I was really intrigued to see that in the Monaco, Monaco memo, say that quickly three times, and how, uh, what's once again is something we don't often think about, is our structure correct? Do we have visibility and do we have a way to get the information from compliance in Asia PAC to compliance in the home office in New York City? So there were some really interesting lessons here and perhaps some that we don't normally get because of the uniqueness of this matter. What, were there any others that, that really you saw that we perhaps don't talk about as much? So the, the one other thing that um, stood out to me is, is you sort of take a step back and look at this, at this case, um, you know, we, as we, as we mentioned, did have, I mean, they had a process in place that, that could have, had they executed it rigorously and appropriately, stop this. So you try to figure out what, what went wrong in this instance. And, and there's, you know, I, where, where I am, just looking at the charging documents and the overall context, there, there's a bit of speculation involved. But one of the fun things about this exercise for me, Tom, um, and, and do, going through all these cases is sort of looking back in time, right? You put these, these cases down sort of back in time, both the resolutions when they happen, but also the conduct. So th this conduct was happening in the, what was it, 2012, 2013 timeframe, we are, for, for banks, coming, coming off the heels of the, the Great Recession, they are aggressively hunting for new targets, new business, and Asia is, is there for the taking. And, and if you're Goldman Sachs, you see a massive opportunity in Malaysia. And with this J-Lo character, it wasn't just these bond offerings. They were hoping, and they put these in their memos to the capital committee, this is where they're going to do the IPOs for these companies that they're acquiring. This is, this is going to just be huge business for us. 
and we need this huge business because we're coming off some tough years. So when you put put it in that context, we're we're talking. This was this was probably the ultimate stress test for Goldman's compliance controls. You have a situation where you are talking about a massive business opportunity. You have employees who are attempting, you know, being very intentional in attempting to deceive your controls and acting not just sort of negligently, but but very very intentional in their in their misdeeds. And it, it sort of was this just really can can our controls stand up to really the kind of the worst case scenario? And here they couldn't, right? And, and I think I don't know why they didn't do this the electronic surveillance in this deal. It seems like this was set up perfectly to do it. Not only were they suspicious that J Lo was involved, but they knew that he was at certain meetings. Uh, so they they it wasn't even just sort of a hey, we're kind of hearing this guy might be involved. They, they knew specifically he was at certain meetings. And they, you know, when push comes to shove, can your controls handle the ultimate worst case scenario? And, and here, you know, they, they're, Goldman couldn't, and their, their system couldn't, despite some, some, you know, I think, good things about it. To your point, too, I'll just add about the structure. I think that's a, it's a really, uh, sometimes a very simple process for depending on the size of the company and the structure of it for for a company like Goldman Sachs structure as a as a behemoth bank with various regional hubs and you know groups that do different things it structure is really tricky and you had a as you mentioned a, a compliance process in sort of the private wealth management area that was working really well raising some serious red flags and the information wasn't getting to this other part of the business and and Figuring out, frankly, figuring out the structure to make that happen is it quite an exercise in and of itself, but something that's that's really important and was in, was important before the Monaco memo. But I think that emphasis on it is, is a good reminder for companies to be taking a look. If you if you're if you've got a complex organization but a very simple compliance structure, you know, it, it, you might want to take a look at that to see make sure all your your bases are covered. So that's a great point about a couple of things. One is the timing of these deals and coming off the Great Recession of 2008. You're absolutely right. Goldman Sachs was aggressively and actively looking for deals. And like manna from heaven, these deals fell, allegedly fell in their laps. And the fees Goldman generated were basically $200 million per bond offering, so $600 million total going to the Goldman Partnerships. So it was a huge windfall for Goldman. There's a couple of other things that I have to bring up. And one is that there was a change at the very top of Goldman during the time of the investigation and resolution. Lloyd Blankfeld was the CEO and he retired and David Solomon uh, became the CEO. There was never any comments about whether this was related to this transaction or, or F FCPA enforcement action, but J. Lo actually had a meeting with Lloyd Blankfeld. And I think if you want to see how a tone is set in an organization, when you have an off, obviously nefarious character who's been rejected as a private wealth client meeting with the CEO of your company, I think that sends a, a strong message. The second thing, though, is we have to uh, maybe step, well, not maybe, we have to step completely out of the enforcement action now and bring us to the present day, once again, to the Monaco memo, where there was a large and lengthy discussion of clawbacks. Well, Goldman, on its own, engaged in clawbacks of senior executives who were involved or just senior executives at the time of this enforcement action. It was not a part of the enforcement action. It was not referenced in the enforcement action. It was done afterwards. It was done internal to Goldman. But when I read the Monaco memo regarding clawbacks, this was the best example I could think of where uh, clawbacks did occur, um, not just one or two people, but uh, across a wide range of executives. And I think that component of this case, and I have to say it is a component of this case, even though it's not a component of the FCPA or broader anti-corruption enforcement action, should be studied uh, to see how was it done, what contractual provisions were in place, 
I think Goldman senior executives had an incentive to provide the clawbacks and, and voluntarily accept them. But this really struck me as, as we were preparing for this podcast. We hadn't talked about clawbacks in a long, long time, if ever. And here we have it on uh, September, September 15th, the, uh, DA, the DAG talking about clawbacks, and we have this one case that we're preparing for. I was wondering maybe your thoughts on either of those points. Yeah, the, the clawback point is, is really interesting. It has not come up in it. We've done, what is this, the 10th, the one of these series. This was not planned. We didn't, we didn't say, hey, let's do Goldman because of this comment on the clawback. This is all coincidence. But it's really interesting uh, timing for that because this is the only example I can think of where this happened. I'm sure it's happened in others, but maybe this, this one was, was more well publicized. Um, and, you know, I think... Uh, uh, I don't want to turn this to a conversation about the, the Monaco memo and the, the recent policy changes. I'm sure you have other podcasts that are going to talk about that. Um, but that, to me, that was, that was probably the most interesting piece of those policy announcements was, was the clawbacks. And, right. um, you know, cause it's, it's, it's one of the places where really a focus had never, you know, it hadn't been there before. And now, now there is, and uh, clients are going to be, and some, some clients will be scrambling a little bit to, to address it. But, you know, I think this was a good example, probably a perfect test case for it. I know it wasn't a test case, but um, because you had uh, a, a group of senior executives here who profited, whether they were directly involved or not, they absolutely profited from these ill-gotten gains. I mean, as you mentioned, it was six hundred million dollars in eighteen months um, that that they earned in fees on on these deals. And I think it was more. I think there's a couple other uh, ancillary deals as well. And there were a lot of people who sort of, maybe they weren't directly involved, maybe they didn't know, but they kind of failed in, in what they were supposed to be doing. And so for so part of that, I think for Goldman, looking back, you know, uh, for, what was it, kind of eight, eight years or so from from when they resolved this to, <clears throat> to uh, from, from when the conduct was when they resolved this, to, to sort of say as a, as a fairness point, Hey, some of these people that we, we paid all this money to kind of failed here. We, we need to call some of that back. I think it's really interesting. This is an interesting example of it. Uh, as you mentioned, it's not mentioned in the, the charging documents. I don't. I didn't see any reference that Goldman got any type of credit for doing that, or or even did it sort of before. I I, I don't know on top of my head when the timing of it was. But it's interesting now because I think you know had, had, had advancing this now. I think it would have been a very deliberate decision that would have been done as part of this resolution to try to get some sort of credit uh, on the front end for doing it. Uh, there's one other point I want to raise with you about this resolution. And once again, this did not, this was not a part of the charging documents or the FCPA or other anti-corruption resolution. But a year after the resolution, Goldman Sachs uh, publicly uh, provided information on the compliance updates that they had put in place. And, We've seen that a few times. Companies have been very open and transparent. From where I sit, I absolutely love it, uh, not so much because of what the company is saying, whether they're beating their chest or not, but as a benchmark that other compliance professionals can look at this and say, well, this is what Goldman Sachs has done. Uh, is this a, a, something that we could consider as well? So I was wondering uh, about your thoughts and, and have you counseled clients or even had those discussions with clients that uh, they would be perhaps more transparent on their overall compliance upgrades or policies than we typically see? It, it does come up some. I, um, you know, I think to me and, and, and clients ultimately in making this decision, sometimes it's, it's very company specific about how detailed the policies are. We work with some companies whose, whose policies are extremely detailed with you know, we're talking about got names of people who are responsible for certain things and phone numbers and, and internal processes that really you don't want to just put out to the entire world to know. There are other clients who have much more of a policy statement. Maybe that's supported by more specific procedures or, or work instructions or something to that, to that effect. If you have a policy that is a, a general policy statement, I'm fully in favor uh, as a company for publishing that. I think there's a lot of benefits to it. Uh, even if it's just your code of conduct to, to, to let the world know that you have a compliance program in place, ensure all your business partners know that, that you do and, and, and that you take this stuff seriously. Um, it helps your employees who, who are maybe out in the field getting these requests or having these uncomfortable conversations have something to point to to say, hey, our company takes this really seriously. 
you can find our policies on our website. You know, my hands are tied. I can't, there's nothing I can do here. This is something that, that's really serious. So I, I think if the circumstances are right, it's all upside to doing it. And as you mentioned, just, just from a, a more macro level, it's helpful for other companies in, in, the, in, the, in the world, in the, in the business, in the industry to benchmark and to see and to get good ideas. And that, that's, you know, in, in a lot of ways that benefits everybody. So uh, any, any final thoughts uh, that you might have uh, want to leave us with for the Goldman Sachs anti-corruption resolutions, given its uh, massiveness uh, and its position on the rankings? Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll leave the listeners with this. If, if you're interested in this case, and you should be, because it, it is so chock full. There's so many angles. It's so chock full of uh, juicy details. We didn't even... We didn't even get into how the money was used, Tom. Well, you could have an entire podcast on uh, on the connection between this scandal and the Wolf of Wall Street movie. It's it, this this is where this goes, or, or or Dumb and Dumberer, I think was another one that was kind of came out of this. But there's a, there's a book uh, called The Billion Dollar Whale. It's a fantastic read. It is not a legal uh, read. It's it's it reads like a novel written by Tom Wright and and uh, Bradley Hope. Um, really dives into this in detail and is really interesting. So for people who are interested, I, I'd highly recommend that. And uh, I would just add that uh, we, we really just barely skimmed the surface. We didn't go into any of the ancillary bribes, uh, corruption that was going on, any of the individuals, uh, the lavish lifestyles they lived. Uh, uh, J-Lo had uh, Britney Spears pop out of a cake for a birthday for $150,000 for 30 seconds. Uh, it really had a little bit of everything. But I guess the final thought I had, Mike, was having um, reviewed uh, the materials again and then sat with you for this podcast, that as big as this was and as massive as it was, there were really some significant lessons that every compliance practitioner uh, could take away from this and um, think about how they applied to their compliance program. So I hope our listeners will find uh, this one useful. And there's a lot more. Uh, we would both contribute if you wanted to continue the conversation. And uh, Mike is right about the book. It is absolutely fabulous. And it's by the reporters who broke the story. So if you want more, check it out. So Mike, till next time. Yeah, thanks, Tom. It's fun. 